Hi, and welcome to another episode of Legislative Report. I'm your state representative, Ryan McKenzie, and we're here at the 102nd Pennsylvania Farm Show. We're gonna start the show by talking with Arlen Schantz from Lehigh County. He owns Evergreen Farm, and it's been in his family since 1765, which is incredibly impressive, Arlen. So welcome, and thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me here, and uh, yes, uh, the farm was started way back even before the revolution, and they say, I'm not sure if it's true, that it's one of the few farms in the county that still is in its original ownership from the beginning. That, that's incredible and really a testament to you and your family that you've held on to that and continued to use it as an operating working farm. That, that's incredible. So we're here in the main hall right now and we're looking at the Christmas tree display. Uh, Christmas trees are a main part of your business at Evergreen Farm. So why don't you start out by telling us what types of trees you have on your farm? Okay. Yes, uh, we've been growing Christmas trees well ever since. My dad started Dad and Mom started planting them and selling them and uh, just continued that. Uh, we have uh, the most popular one right now is Fraser fir. We have uh, Concolor fir. We have Blue Spruce. And there are a few other couple pines here and there that are pretty well fading away that used to be popular in the past but no longer are a big item. Okay, and now what signals a change or why do you start adopting different trees, one versus the other? Is it personal preference or is it a regional preference or what makes you pick up on those specific types of trees for your farm? Well, I guess the the main thing is like in any other business, it's customer preference. Okay. Whatever they want to buy, we try to grow. The problem is with Christmas trees, you're talking about seven years, eight years, nine years, 10 years down the road. So it's hard to uh, know ahead of time what to plant. But it's a gradual change, so uh, it's been working out fairly decent. We have the blue spruce right behind us here, so why don't we start with this and tell us a little bit about this tree and what somebody would look at when they see a tree like this. The blue spruce, I, I'm sort of phasing out the blue spruce. Uh, if you would touch the needles of the blue spruce, they are quite sticky. And uh, they, uh, you know, stick to people, especially if you have softer hands and a lot of customers do not like to deal with that and another thing about the blue spruce it doesn't last quite as long once when it's cut and the needles dry out quicker than some of the others okay and now we have uh, right behind us here a Fraser fir let's take a look at the Fraser fir and you can tell us a little bit about this one and what makes this one unique you can just tell to the touch it's much softer yes you can tell and uh, if, if well, first of all you can you look at the tree and you see a nice green tree if you would happen to turn, look at the bottom, which you probably can't see in the camera, it's sort of a silvery, whitish type color. So that's one characteristic of the Fraser fir. The other big thing it is, it does hold the needles really long. It doesn't dry out real quick. And it just has a, a pleasant uh, tree looking, uh, you know, shape to it. Yeah, it really does. I mean, this is really a classic Christmas tree look. Really a, a nice look here. Nice uh, needles, nice soft needles, and then also nice branches to hang your ornaments on. Right. And, and I should mention, though, like on my farm, I tried not to have them quite as full as this. Uh, it, maybe it's my preference, but a lot of customers really do like that also, so that when you hang like an ornament on it, there's a little room underneath for it to to hang there rather than lay on the branches below it. So it looks more like the, if you want to say, the old fashioned Christmas tree, not so many branches in it. Yep. And now a tree like this, how long would it take for a tree like this to grow? Probably around eight years, could be up to nine or 10, depending on the conditions of the year. And uh, since the trees are quote, all natural, sometimes you get defects and it takes an extra year or two till you try to, correct the defect and and of course then uh, you get a deer rub here and there and that you have to sort of uh, shape it out shape it so uh, the tree looks more like a tree again all right Arlen so here's the con color fir tree and this is the last one that we're gonna look at tell us a little bit about this tree the unique thing about the con color fir tree is that it if you rub the needles or when you take it from the outside into the warmer room it gives off a sort of a citrusy smell and it just 
that here it's becoming more popular all the time because people love that citrusy smell that fills the room almost like you're in in the south in the tropics oh, okay great well it's a beautiful tree and this one is very full and yeah. so and that's that's again the preference of the grower okay the way they prune it all right and like i say i try to have mine a little more open and uh the customers seem to like that but i might mention uh one other thing that uh, Christmas trees, you know, I do as a business, and sometimes I, I get uh, people are saying, oh, it's a shame to cut a tree. So I, I remind, I mean, I have various tree fields, like I mentioned, on the hillsides, full of, uh, quote, deer and birds and every, all the wildlife. And the big thing about that, I, I say, well, you know how many trees I would have here on this hillside if you didn't come and cut my Christmas tree? And it, I'd say zero. Meaning, yep. uh, because it is a business, because people are buying them, I plant more, and sure. and uh, that's what uh, keeps the cycle going. There you go. Yeah. No, that's great. That's a very good point. So glad you brought that to our attention. And now the trees we're looking at here, you've talked about how you might do them a little differently because if you were going to sell them to somebody who actually wanted to use it as a Christmas tree, these are show trees here at the farm. So do you think there are different attributes that maybe judges are looking for in a tree than what maybe a customer is looking for in a tree? I think the industry has sort of switched, sort of gradually moved that way that uh, looking at it, it looks so pretty, all that full green uh, branches and uh, they sort of forget that the reason you have a Christmas tree is to put ornaments on and decorate and, and after you do that, you know, it's a little different story. <laughs> Well, that's a good point. So that's a, a nice practical and real world application that you keep in mind there for your customers. So I'm, I'm sure they appreciate that. And thank you for everything you do in Lehigh County. I know you're an active member of the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and you're very active locally as well. So we really do appreciate all that you do in Lehigh County for us, Arlen. Next up, we're going to head over to meet with Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding, and talk to him about some agriculture issues facing Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania agriculture is diverse. That diversity is our strength. Over 58,000 farms in the state, with nearly 500,000 working in agriculture. Seeding Pennsylvania's economy with tens of billions of dollars. A top five producer in the nation with more than 10 agricultural commodities is intertwined in our communities. The fabric of Pennsylvania, each strand unique, each contributing to agriculture and to our Commonwealth. We're here joined by Secretary Russell Redding from the Department of Agriculture. It's great, great to see you. Mr. Secretary, Happy New thank Year you to for you. joining us. Happy thank New you. Year to you as Good well. Good to be here. Well, we're going to jump right in. This is the 102nd Pennsylvania Farm Show. It's yeah. a real tradition here in Pennsylvania. Hundreds of thousands of people come through. Yeah. Tell us about this year's show. It's a great uh, annual event. You know, it's a chance for us, I think, as Pennsylvanians to sort of celebrate part of our history. Uh, it's 102 years in the making, but it's also unique in that we take eight days in January to celebrate an industry that uh, you know, has changed so much over over the 102 years, right? There's a time when this was all sort of uh, the farmers coming in here today. The majority of the folks here are consumers who want that connection to ag. They like it. They like the food that's here, obviously, but they want that connection to who's feeding them. And that's a great story and a great opportunity for us. Let's talk about a couple different industries and issues that we yeah. have. A pretty diverse industry, agriculture mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. So the first one is a, a new thing for us here in our area, industrial hemp. Tell yeah. us how that's been going now that it's been legalized here in the state. Yeah, we're excited about it. You know, the, to think that uh, we, we, we 
you know, through the work of the legislature and governor, we were able to sort of get uh, industrial hemp back on the land of Pennsylvania, had been missing for 70 years. And I say to everybody, when you think about that space, I mean, you've lost a whole generation of seed technologies and markets and infrastructure and stuff. We're rebuilding that. So we're, we're excited. Uh, 2017 was our first sort of reintroduction of that uh, after many years. 2018, we're excited about the opportunity. We had 14 projects last year. Right. We're hoping to <laughs> get 50 projects this year, permits out, uh, with the potential for 5,000 acres total. You've got wow. some folks in Lehigh Valley who have been instrumental in you know, getting the narrative, the conversation, the energy around this sort of uh, in the right direction. So. Uh, I, th I think it has great potential, in so many ways, great potential. All right, well, that's a, an exciting development. There's a, another issue that's been a little more problematic for our area, yeah. especially in Berks County, the spotted lanternfly. It's been devastating the area for a couple years now. I know the department's doing everything we can to really get it under control. Can you give us an update on, on what's going on there? Yeah, so it, it is, is one of those problems, first time in North America that's here, not a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, history of it uh, in, in Pennsylvania, obviously from a research standpoint, how to control it. Uh, we're concerned because it is one of those uh, invasive pests that uh, everything it, it, it touches, it likes, right? So that's our hardwoods and the grapes and the apples and all the products. Uh, so we're working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, working with the local communities. They have a 13 county quarantine zone uh, now set in place. We'll work hard here in 2018 to try to eradicate this thing that still remains the goal. But we need to have uh, some way to uh, control them, uh, chemical treatment. You can't go to the store, right, and buy any type of spray as an example. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of worries with it, but we're working hard at it. And now, in the meantime, until we find a solution, what yeah. should people know and what can they do, what precautionary measures can they do to help contain the spread? Yeah, I would say anybody who's, who's uh, in, in the zone, obviously, um, do a couple of things for us. Please don't transport this anywhere. Um, you know, be, be cognizant of, listen, you can't look under the car as an example, but you know, if it's in the car on something, be very careful about that. Uh, don't, uh, you know, go ahead and kill it right? Get rid of it. We don't want it. Uh, but it would be good to know the location of those bugs. So you can go to the Department of Agriculture's website. Uh, there is a spot at Lanternfly on there. If you click on that and simply give us some information, uh, would be helpful because it helps us sort of track yep. where it is, its movement, uh, and, and our control strategies as well. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, we're going to hit on one more topic here, and uh, it's yeah. an exciting one for Pennsylvania, is our brewers across Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's a strong industry. It's growing pretty significantly. Right. Uh, tell us about that and, and how that relates to the agriculture it's industry. It's a nice sort of connection. You know, we've got, we've got uh, you know, breweries and brew pubs. We have hops being produced to, uh, to uh, grow them, to produce those, uh, those brews. You have this uh, in interesting intersection between the spirits industry and tourism and the identification of the f of food in, in the marketplace. We try to connect all of that with the Pennsylvania preferred brew. Great. So the, the keystone, the check mark uh, on the label tells you it's Pennsylvania. Well, yeah, thank all you the again, best. Secretary. It's a pleasure. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. We're back here in the main hall, and straight behind me is the butter sculpture, which is one of the central attractions here at the farm show. This year was another huge success for the 102nd Farm Show. Hundreds of thousands of visitors came through to see the exhibitions of animals, products, and all things created here in Pennsylvania. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Legislative Year Report. I'm your state representative, Ryan McKenzie, and we'll see you next time.